For the last 90 years Batman has been around, the character has been anything but static. Sure, the caped billionaire orphan who swore a war on crime and vengeance for his dead parents has key elements that have stayed exactly the same, but every on-screen and comic iteration reconstructs the Dark Knight to fit the time. But humbly, there is one iteration of Batman which might be very close to the definitive Batman that has stood the test of time for three decades, and that is Batman the Animated Series. I'm Dan Umpton, and this is the Doomcast. Okay, Labor Day weekend of 1992, I don't remember anything about what I did other than watching Fox Kids in the living room of our Alabama home. I'm having trouble finding confirmation of this, but I'm almost 99% sure that the first episode that actually aired was uh, the Man Bat on Leather Wings episode, despite being the third in the order on any media release or in streaming. But I was immediately in. I was had, just right out of the gate. The animation was better quality than any American animation at the time, uh, but the design and the tone was what really made me a lifelong fan of this series. And it's also what still holds up. Created by Bruce, Tim, Paul Dini, and Mitch Bryan, the series drew heavily on some of the darker stylistic choices of the Tim Burton Batman films, but the look was entirely different unto itself. It was also heavily influenced by the early Superman Fleischer cartoons. Easily, it still fell into the category of a noir between both the Elfman theme and contemplative, creeping background score, as well as the dramatic shot and lighting choices. The world of Gotham is set in a timeless art deco that developers came to start calling Dark Deco. Uh, this Gotham is both in the here and now, but also in the distant past, both classic cars and high technology, black and white televisions but supercomputers, police blimps but modern corporate cronyism and crime. Batman himself is possibly one of the most iconic versions as well. That suit design meshed both classic, contemporary looks, but still fell within that sleek, dark deco Bruce Tim design. As did the Batmobile, a redesign of longer Tim Burton styles, but still looked like a modern supercar conception, but something that might have been designed in the 40s, 50s, or even 30s. Arguably, the choice of Kevin Conroy as Batman cemented him as the definitive voice of animated Batman for nearly 30 years. Of course, Mark Hamill as Joker is just as iconic and beloved. No two voice actors have reprised the roles so many times. In fact, it's arguable that the Joker relaunched Hamill's very successful second act in life as a voice actor, and it almost didn't happen either. The original voice actor cast was none other than Tim Curry. Yes, for real, and he developed severe bronchitis after the filming of Ferngully and had to be recast. But the writing is what cemented this as a classic. Paul Dini is a brilliant writer, and he's done as much, in my opinion, to develop the Batman mythos as Alan Grant, Denny O'Neill, or Scott Snyder. Harley Quinn, Renee Montoya, both were created by him, characters that became iconic in their own ways outside of Batman the Animated Series. Harley Quinn, arguably one of the most popular characters with DC now. In fact, the relationship and partnership between Harley and Poison Ivy is just as old as the character herself, uh, dumping Joker in the episode Harley and Ivy just two years into the show. Uh, Dini also helped adapt classic comic stories from work uh, for scribes like Alan Grant and Denny O'Neill in Dreams and Darkness and Appointment in Crime Alley. Occasionally, Dini chose to combine a few classic stories together into one episode, like, for example, The Laughing Fish. It's a comic combination of three different episodes, which on their own, Dini said uh, that he knew a direct adaptation of any of them could never be approved by censors for an audience for children. Even the feature film, Mask of the Phantasm, was a partial adaptation of Batman Year One and Batman Year Two. Dini's flair for dialogue and his deeply empathetic antagonists also stand out. More than one-dimensional pastiches, he gave many characters a depth that they lacked on the page. Mr. Freeze's wife, Nora, and her illness is now a staple of the character in comics but first appeared on this show. Poison Ivy was rarely the principled eco-terrorist that she became later prior to this show. Clayface's two-part appearance in Feet of Clay was not only jarring for me to watch as a child, but as an adult, I look back and realize that it was the first story that depicted a gay male relationship positively, 
even if it was heavily coated. And that's part of the legacy of Tim and Dini's work. The next 15 years, the DC animated universe was the first fully cohesive, stylistically linked, shared on-screen cosmic comic universe. From the new adventures of Batman to Superman to the Justice League and the Justice League International and a whole multitude of additional films. Even series like Young Justice and Teen Titans could never have existed without this show. Not only are the DC animated films and TV series better than WB's live action DC, some of those films are better than Marvel's MCU. And yes, I 100% mean that. For people to complain about wokeness in media, also, this show made changes to characters' races. This show had a gay actor depicting Batman, a lesbian relationship, gay relationships, positively presented black and Latino characters like Montoya and even Harvey Dent 30 years before woke was even a concept, back when it was just depicting real life. Uh, and it did it without an agenda or heavy hands. It told and retold the best Batman stories of the prior 60 years, reinvented both Bruce, the Bat, his supporting cast of friends and foes, and cemented the look, feel, and style of Batman with impeccable writing and character design that has held up now for more than 30 years. The entire series, except inexplicably episodes 21 through 24, are now streaming on HBO Max. Uh, or if you're a nut job like me, you already own it on some physical copy somewhere. And don't worry, if you're wondering if I have a 30th anniversary X-Men episode planned, it's coming next month. Thanks everybody for watching. This has been the Doomcast. I'll see you next week.